The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patsy Hampton, and on behalf of the Center for the Study of Social Policy and the Early Childhood Learning and Innovation Network of Communities, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Today, we will be exploring strategies to engage families for systems change in early childhood. These strategies are part of a toolkit released last month called Ripples of Transformation, Families Leading Systems Change in Early Childhood. Before we get started, I want to turn to Sahar Wazirali, who will be supporting our technology needs today for some quick housekeeping tips. Next slide, Sahar. Hi, everyone. My name is Sahar, as Patsy mentioned. Uh, I just wanted to welcome all of you to the webinar and just give you some quick pointers on housekeeping. So as you will see in the, on the right, you will see a, a window where you have the opportunity to select your audio preference as well as any questions you have. Uh, and this is a really unique opportunity for you to raise your hand as you see with the yellow hand to the left of the questions pane. So any question you have, uh, just type it in for the staff to answer at the end of the session. Thank you guys so much and please enjoy the webinar. Great. So um, the Center for the Study of Social Policy works to secure equal opportunities and better futures for all children and families, especially those most, most often left behind. As part of our work, EC Link, or the Early Childhood Learning and Innovation Network for Communities, was developed by and for communities to support families and improve results for young children in communities across the country with a focus on accelerating the development of effective, integrated, local early childhood systems. Over the past year, our communities have had the opportunity to work on four research to action projects designed to advance the field of early childhood systems. Grantees undertook research that provided new insight into a question or potential strategy of interest, implemented or tested their findings within their local context, and shared lessons learned. This webinar is one of the products made possible through our Research to Action grant on family engagement. As we go to the next slide, it's my pleasure, my pleasure to introduce you to Malia Franklin, the project lead for this body of work that you'll be hearing about today. Malia? Hi, everyone. I am so thrilled to see all of you online and listening uh, to this webinar. I am working as a family engagement consultant with First Five Alameda County, who is the lead agency on this Research to Action project. And I've been facilitating the collaborative process of uh, gathering the information and ideas from our cohort and externally to create this family engagement continuum and toolkit that we're going to be um, overviewing and diving into today. I uh, bring with me experience as a founder and former executive director of a grassroots parent group, Bay Area Plan Parent Leadership Action Network. Next slide. So just to give you a quick uh, agenda review, we are going to, I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the Ripples of Transformation Family Engagement Model and Toolkit. And then we're going to have three presenters presenting um, strategies from the ground. Uh, one, developing leadership pathways. Another, strengthening the commitment to racial equity in early childhood. And then finally, sharing power with families. And each of these are going to be coming from a different part of the country. We're going to have some time, I'm sure not nearly enough, for questions and answers. And then at the very end of the webinar, you'll see a survey pop up um, where we are asking you about what would be most valuable as next steps in this project. Next slide. So I want to introduce our presenters very briefly. Um, I'm so blessed to work with a fantastic team of leaders in early childhood. And in just a few minutes, you're going to be hearing from three of our EC Link organization representatives, Gina Mittal from United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, 
and Lenita Sanders and Marsha Guthrie, both from Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County, Florida, and from Lisa Erickson uh, from First Five Alameda County. Um, and so they will be presenting the strategies as we dive into that. Next slide. So now we introduce ourselves and we want to hear from you. Where are you from? Uh, Sahara is going to um, give you a poll where you can select one of the following. West, Southwest, Midwest, Southeast, or Northeast. And if you just go and click where you're calling from, we'll be able to report out where all 318 and counting of you are coming from. So go ahead and click one of the options on your screen and hit submit. So as I'm waiting for the results, I am just going to say again how excited I am to have you here. It really is um, so much a testament to how much, uh, how needed this information is. So we have a winner. The West is the represented at 36%, the Southwest at 8%, the Midwest at 19%, the Southeast at 17%, and the Northeast at 20%. So we have a pretty good spread of participants across the country, and we're thrilled to have you all here. Next slide. Next slide. Great. So what you're looking at here is the cover of the toolkit, Ripples of Transformation, Families Leading Change in Early Childhood Systems. And this is really um, a fantastic opportunity to take family engagement and our thoughts and um, ways of looking at it in a new direction. Research tells us that when families are engaged in their children's education, children are more likely to succeed, but there's so much more that engaged and active parent leaders can achieve if this is just one step in a journey to leadership and advocacy roles in their children's schools, early childhood programs, and in their communities, and even in systems of care. Next slide. So why do we, what happens when we engage families in advocacy and leadership for system change? There's really, um, it's hap change happening on several level levels. When families are developing their leadership, it benefits their children and their community. When programs are better able to meet families' needs in culturally responsive ways, that in turn benefits the families. And when families raise their voices, uh, about what they need uh, to succeed, systems are pushed to improve services and remove barriers. Next slide. So we chose um, the symbol of ripples for ripples of transformation and I wanted to share with you that this was inspired by a parent in a focus group that we conducted who said, telling one parent about their rights is like telling 10 or 20. There's a ripple of sharing information. And really, that was one metaphor that helped us to see that a journey to parent leadership is a fluid journey where parents are entering and exiting at various times and points along a continuum. 
and that each level of engagement, each stop along the continuum, impacts others. For example, parents impact their children and other parents, the organization, the community, and then in turn policies and systems. So their impacts are rippling out and rippling in. Um, as, as opposed to a linear journal journey, this is really more of a fluid journey. Next slide, please. So right now what you're looking at is the continuum, the family engagement continuum that we developed. Um, why did we choose to do uh, a continuum as a definition? Again, rather than a destination or a single strand of activities, we wanted to explore the definition of family engagement as a continuum or a journey with key stops along the way. We built on many existing models of family engagement, such as strengthening families, and Head Start's parent, family, and community engagement interactive framework. We noticed that there was a lack of resources also for engaging families outside of the classroom setting, especially in early childhood systems of care, which, by which we mean the network of community-based programs and public agencies providing comprehensive developmental and supportive services for young children and their families. We also noticed that there was a lack of engagement resources or family engagement resources um, that were detailing opportunities for parents to develop leadership and advocacy skills for systems change. So we decided that we wanted to look all along a continuum and we wanted to really bring some newer information and a greater emphasis on um, influencing policies and systems using parent advocacy and leadership as a strategy. So just briefly, how did we come up with this continuum? As you might be questioning, well, every parent is a leader at different parts of this continuum. We had to sort of decide on some categories, but we wanted to emphasize that there was a lot of overlap. Um, we, we interviewed, I think, 20 key informants, some of whom were in our EC-Link network and some of whom were in the various other communities to really find out how did they engage families, how did they envision families traveling from one point in a continuum to another. Then we held four focus groups with families um, who were already established leaders in organizations or systems. So we, we compared the results from each of these research processes and what we found was, was a similarity that, that both the organizations and the families were describing a process of traveling along a continuum, starting with um, the first touch with an organization, which often might be um, as a participant in a support group or a workshop or in receiving information, along the way to finally to um, being an advocate and a leader for systems change. So as you can see from this slide, we divided the continuum into three main categories, engaging with their children, shaping programs and services, and influencing policies and systems. Next slide. So now I'm going to go through very briefly each of the phases of the continuum. Um, so you can kind of get a deeper sense of what we're talking about. Um, the first one, families engaging with their children. What we found is that many early childhood organizations focus their family engagement efforts here, where families are receiving information and services and beginning to learn about their child's development. Examples here include home visiting, support groups, parenting workshops, etc. And in a moment, we're going to hear about an initiative that created a pathway for families to grow from engaging with their own children to engaging and educating other families in a parent partner model. Next slide. And all of these, of course, you can look at it more depth in the toolkit, which is part of the attachments to this webinar. So in the next part, shaping programs and services, here we see strategies to integrate families into the fabric of our agencies as partners, mentors, and peer educators. This phase both increases the capacity of agencies to serve family in more 
families in more culturally responsive ways, while ironically challenging the capacity of staff to support parents in these new roles. And a significant part of organizations' challenges around these um, uh, integrating families in these new roles centers around the fact that our organizations mirror dominant culture, and this can hinder our abilities to engage families authentically and provide equitable services. And in just a little while, we're going to learn about an agency that addressed this challenge by moving toward a racial equity framework. Next slide. So in influencing policies and systems, this is an area where we feel there's tremendous opportunity for growth. Not many organizations are engaging families as leaders and advocates for systems change, often because agencies and systems lack the capacity and know-how, and because it can get messy when families demand changes that shake up the powers that be. Later, we're going to hear about how one county partnered with a grassroots parent group to leverage parent power for systems change. Next slide, please. This was just a very brief overview of what's in the toolkit, and we're hope you, we hope you're going to dive in and get more of the information and the strategies and resources. Uh, in the toolkit, we identify several successful strategies, and in this webinar, we're going to look at just three of them and in brief. So the first one uh, we're going to look at is developing leadership pathways. In a moment, I'll introduce that presenter. Then we're going to look at increasing a commitment to racial equity and sharing power with families. So those are three presentations that are happening right now. I'm going to introduce our first panelist. Um, next slide, please. Gina Mittal, Director of Community Impact from United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Welcome, and please take it from here. Thanks so much, Malia. Um, so I, my name is Gina, and I work at United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Thrive in Five and our parent leadership approach. Next slide. So Thrive in Five started in 2008 as a public-private partnership between the City of Boston and the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Thrive in Five ended fairly recently in June 2016, um, but much of the work continues on at United Way. Thrive in Five was a collective impact organization that aimed to support the school readiness of Boston's youngest children. And we did this through focusing on three, three key areas, which were quality early education, healthy child development, and community and family engagement. And this last piece is what I'll be talking about today. We did that through a program called Boston Children Thrive. Um, it's, it might be cut off a little bit at the bottom, but you can go to our website, www.thriveinfiveboston.org, and read much more about Thrive in Five, as well as Boston Children Thrive. We have a number of toolkits and resources um, posted there, open to anyone to use. So the purpose of Boston Children Thrive, which again was the community and family engagement initiative, was to connect disconnected families to each other and to organizations. And through that work, we kind of figured what was what better way to do that, to have to connecting to disconnected families than through another parent who is visible in that community, speaks the languages, and can relate to other parents' experiences. So this is the parent leadership pathway that we created. Uh, and it came about after trying to determine how organizations can engage parents and grow them as leaders. In Boston, parent leaders are called parent partners. And the idea of parent partners came from one of, the, one of our neighborhood partners, East Boston Social Centers. When they had initially applied for some funding from Thrive in Five um, for the Boston Children Thrive program, they included parent partners in their proposal as a way to authentically engage parents in their work and to be able to outreach to more families. The parent leadership pathway takes into account how organizations typically start engaging parents as clients and recipients of services a parent who might be attending a play group or a workshop, to moving them up to attending meetings, being active participants in those, to helping with programming, and then eventually, hopefully, to being paid um, and helping drive an agency's directions um, and mission. 
we also, I do want to emphasize that we do think it's really important as much as is possible that parent partners um, and parent leaders are paid at least a stipend for their time. And as an example of some responsibilities that our parent partners um, do are things like tabling and outreaching to families in their neighborhood, hosting activities in diverse languages, um, and just general outreach to families. Next slide. So this is um, sort of a rough timeline of Boston Children Thrive and the parent partner model. So we've had a number of successes and challenges over the years. Some of the successes are, as you can see, in 2010, we started off in just five neighborhoods. And um, a few years ago, we were able to expand citywide through the Boston Family Engagement Network. Each neighborhood has one to three parent partners, but some of them have up to 12, um, which represents the, the, the large diversity of some of the neighborhoods in Boston. Many parent partners have also been hired into full or part-time positions by their organizations or other partners that they were able to connect to, which has always been you know, a, little bit, a little bittersweet, um, but it's always great to see parent leaders coming and getting additional skills and being able to move on to additional positions. Additionally, we've also seen a lot of successes of parent partners in their programming leading to changes in practices and policies at bigger institutions. So as a specific example, there is one neighborhood in Boston called Dorchester that has a large Vietnamese immigrant population. One of the libraries there and some Vietnamese parents noticed that not many Vietnamese families were visiting the library very often. So instead, some parent leaders got together and decided to start hosting a monthly Vietnamese book club at the library, where families with young children would come to the library, read some Vietnamese children's books, and engage in crafts and activities related to that book. Over time, the library saw an uptick in Vietnamese families signing up for library books, and then they actually started ordering books that were in Vietnamese for the library to meet the needs of this population. We've also started to integrate other concrete tasks into the parent partner role. So you'll see here in about 2015, we were able to include some other um, responsibilities with parent partners. So one big thing that has taken off here in Boston is parent partners conducting developmental screening using the ages and stages questionnaire with other parents. This has helped make the screening tool more widely available to families who might not be involved in a you know, a formal child care program. It also makes it more linguistically and culturally sensitive to meet families' needs. There have also been a number of challenges that we faced. As always, lack of dedicated funding to the development of parent leaders is a struggle. A lot of funding is out there to provide direct programming, which a lot of our parent leaders do. But a big focus, and I think that we see in a lot of nonprofit partners who have parent partners, is the need for ongoing professional development of those parent leaders. And it can be really challenging for different staff at agencies to find the time to set aside to train and supervise their new parent partners. A number of parent partners have been out of the workforce for a while, and some might not have ever held a, an office type position. So while they bring a lot of great skills to the work, they still also, just like any employee anywhere, have, thing, have new skills to develop and it can be sometimes a strain on agency staff to figure out how to balance those responsibilities. Next slide. Um, but just to wrap up, I think there's a number of ways that organizations can move forward with implementing parent leadership strategies and thinking about family engagement um, in a way of sharing power with the families instead of such a top-down approach. So some advice I have for organizations, a big question I get very often is how do you recruit parent leaders? You know, sometimes it feels like finding that, that great, great parent leader is like finding a unicorn in the wild, um, but they're out there. And so some of my tips are to start with existing networks and partners that you have. So going to the local WIC office, the libraries, schools, early education programs, whomever you already work with, and asking who their kind of standout parents are, who shows up, who volunteers, who stands out to them as going above and beyond. Um, and that's a great place to start because you really only need one or two parents to start because once they're committed, they will help you recruit. Um, eventually, parent leaders themselves will become your best recruitment strategy. 
Some other tips are to have concrete tasks for parent leaders to take on. So I've also seen a lot of organizations that maybe find some parents and are really excited to move forward, but the whole thing can feel a little super amorphous and unclear about what families, about what they, how they should utilize their parent leaders. So I do think using the ages and stages questionnaire and training parent leaders to conduct screening with families has been really successful for a lot of agencies. It's a very concrete task. It's a skill that parent leaders are building, um, and it gives them a way to meet other families in their neighborhoods and to become respected leaders in their community. My last um, piece of advice is just to kind of go in knowing that you're always going to be recruiting. It's pretty, at least from what I've seen, pretty rare to have a parent leader stay on for more than a couple of years. You know, it's it's really great when we can give them additional skills and they get more experience and can network and find other positions, but of course it's, it's again, a little bittersweet. So just knowing that you'll always sort of be on the lookout for new parent leaders and figuring out ways to bring them in. Um, I think it's pretty rare to find a team that sticks around for a very long time. So I want to thank you so much, Gina. That was a great job. And now I want to introduce the team from the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County. Lanita and Marsha, take it away. Thank you, Malia. This is Lanita. I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone. Although CSC has been working and trying to address child outcomes for over 30 years, I want to say that we are relatively new to doing this work using a racial equity lens. So we are certainly in the process of learning as we go along. Next slide. As a public entity created specifically to ensure the health and well-being of young children, we focused on birth outcomes using maternal child health lens. As we began to review the data, uh, it became glaringly apparent that there were disparities between black and white birth outcomes. Um, across the county and the state, we began to see that black babies were dying at three times the rate of white babies mostly due to preventable causes, and you can see some of the numbers on the screen. Basically, we were looking at prematurity and low birth weight. So the question then became, what are we going to do about it? We knew that we had to engage the community in this conversation. So through town hall meetings, focus groups, parent surveys, formal and informal chats, we we're able to have families weigh in on the conversation. We had to make the information, though, very relatable, usable, and digestible for the average person. And you know when you're working with data, sometimes that's difficult. But the community told us that they wanted a way to spread the news and to equip people to begin to make changes in their own lives. And this led to the development of community voice taking it to the people, which is a health education program. Local African American lay health educators, people from the community, from the neighborhood, began meeting with African American families in their own neighborhood, where they were comfortable, where they knew each other, teaching them about healthy lifestyles before pregnancy and the benefit of taking like folic acid during the pregnancy, or the impact that having the father's name on the birth certificate could have in that child's life. Once participants graduated from the program, they became lay health advisors, and they were charged with spreading the word and recruiting new participants. We found it to be one of our most successful programs. Over time, we began to address racial disparities in other areas, such as kindergarten readiness, child abuse and neglect, and access to quality child care summer school and after school programs. Working through our Bridges program, which is our neighborhood-based hubs, and working with other community partners, again, we began to engage parents of young children in the dialogue. 
sharing data with them, listening to their experiences and to their stories, and then asking for permission to join them in solving some of these issues with the goal of empowering residents to take ownership of solution-driven initiatives in their own communities, we've learned that when given the opportunity and tools, our families never hesitate to get involved. This has really been sort of our external-facing work. And it really means making a shift. Next slide. So it's moving away really from uh, the personal, the individual, to more of the systemic and institutional. It's about taking one family's story, maybe about how they were told that their son you know, really wasn't grasping some of the kindergarten concepts, to looking across the spectrum and recognizing a larger disproportionate number of African American males not entering kindergarten prepared. It's about looking at uh, institutions and, and practice of work that has a race-based consequence. So our recommendations and some of, some of the steps that we tend to follow are to identify racial equity. And you can't do that, of course, without some training. So we had the opportunity to participate in Racial Equity Institute training with many of our other stakeholders here in the county. We had to look at the numbers. We had to listen to the stories and look for trends. And then you want to engage your stakeholders. Ensure that they are well-educated and informed about the issues. And be as inclusive as possible. Include those who are affected by the program, by the project, or by the issue. Make sure you include those who want to make some changes to the issue. And then those who actually are empowered to make those changes. Together, you can determine what the root causes are, and you can determine whether this is happening at an individual, institutional, or systemic level. And then make sure that your solution is focused. Of course, we can talk about the programs and the problems and the issues all day long, but we really want to find solutions to some of these issues. So this is the time to really engage families and community partners in finding effective ways. And now I'm going to hand the mantle over to my colleague, Marsh Guthrie, who's going to talk about our current internal facing work in the area of racial equity. All right. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, really applaud all of you who were able to sign on this afternoon to join our webinar. So we'll just move to the next slide. So as Alita mentioned, we started our work um, thinking about an external face. So for decades, the Children's Services Council has been engaged in deploying neighborhood-based strategies from the early 1990s, working with um, communities and families, thinking about how to uh, develop a very robust system of care. We've had strong investments in maternal child health. You know, we've had a number of innovative practices in the area of early care and education, and a diverse network of programs that seek to address child maltreatment. And so we've been doing at our work for a number of years, and as Lenita showed you in the first slide, we were looking at outcomes. We're a significant outcome-driven organization. But one of the things is that we recognized that although we were making improvements over the years, there were still a number of stark disparities in terms of how our communities of color, populations of cover, color, were performing regard in relationship to their white counterparts. And so one of the things that we've been doing over the last year, a year and a half or so, is really trying to take a look at not just what's happening in the external environment in terms of where we're making investments and programs, but looking at our internal strategies. So what are the systems, how are the systems designed in order to get to the level of change that we're looking for in the direct program? And so there are three major elements that we want to call attention to, and that's really around organizational vision. And so we've been on a journey over the last year. Uh, you know, approaching year and a half and looking at what is our expectations for using a racial equity lens, how are we engaging not just our external stakeholders, so holding the hands of our families, our communities, and our partners and stakeholders that we're working with, but how are our internal staff skilled up and scaled up in terms of understanding the importance of issues of equity and specifically racial equity? How are we doing this 
cross-functionally, and how can we ensure alignment? And that led us to develop a racial equity framework. So our framework is just a toolkit that uh, provides guidance, and we've also created space to advance these conversations in our organization. Next slide. And so one of the things that I would just kind of share with anyone who's going to be taking, embarking on this, is really ensure that your organization is ready. It's very easy to do the direct programmatic work, to work directly with children and families. And sometimes, even though we have challenges with how we engage children and families and our community partners in this kind of work, especially early childhood systems change work, it's a whole other animal when you try to think about is your organization structured accordingly to support the work that you want to see happen on the ground? And so we've had to ask ourselves some significant questions. Do we have common language? What are we talking about? What are the differences between when we talk about racial equity or just equity in general? Um, what are our expectations, both internally and externally? How will we know when change is happening? What will that look like? What are the measurements and marks? Also significantly ask our question, ourselves the question, why is the organization invested in doing this work? What will the change process look like? Do we want to think about our organization staff as a whole engage in some implicit bias test? What are our guiding principles? And how do we create a platform for ongoing communication and feedback? Would we create and develop a community practice format to help move this agenda forward? Next slide. And so these conversations and discussions. I know this is a little bit hard to read, but I do understand that the slides, the slides will be changed, will be shared at a later time at the, at the close of the webinar. We've developed our racial equity framework. So this is a set of pillars. The, the middle identifies some of those critical internal components that we need to examine through a racial equity lens to see if we're making the kinds of changes we, we would want to anticipate. So what is happening in our data construct? What's happening around operations? What is our procurement process? What are the programs and providers? How are we supporting them in developing, whether that's learning networks, training, community engagement? And how are we consistently asking ourselves questions? So what we developed was a whole set of guiding questions and a process to apply a racial equity tool as a starting point. So we recognize that this framework is simply a plan for action. Our ultimate goal is to use the framework and guiding principles to create a racial equity plan. This plan will be at the heart of how we continue developing our early childhood system of care, one that is inclusive of our stakeholders, starting with our families, the communities, children and youth as appropriate, and the staff responsible for shepherding this work. We recognize that, again, our goal is to create a more transparent organization and that this framework is just a guidance for how we will operationalize our overall racial equity strategy. So for those of you who are thinking about how can you advance such a strategy as you develop your own early childhood system of care, the things that we would want to leave you with, with is to be clear on your intention. Why are you doing this? Um, develop your common language. What's your success criteria? Make sure that you identify a champion within your organization who is really going to be taking the gauntlet and moving this work forward. Identify an internal champion, but ensure that you galvanize and you engage your external champions in the communities and that families need to be at the heart of this. Families understand the divisiveness in populations, how they are set apart from others who are like them, and they want to be a part of not just the problem solving, but the solution finding. And they. Uh, I think that's just a recipe for action. This, again, we are very in our infancy, as Lenita mentioned, and advancing this work. And we continue to learn and do more. And we'll share with the field as we develop our strategy. So thank you. I'll kick it back to Malia now. Fantastic job. Thank you so much for sharing this rich work. And now we're going to go to the next slide, where we're going to hear a story about how, when, County Committee partner with a grassroots parent group. Um, and so I want to introduce Lisa Erickson from First Five Alameda County. Take it away, Lisa. Thank you, Malia. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really excited to be here to present this work and also to learn from um, the partners that are also on the call. Um, 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the background of our Alameda County Early Childhood Policy Committee, a little bit about its structure, um, some of the lessons that we've learned, and then give you a little bit of advice if you wanted to do something like this in your uh, communities. So next slide, please. So uh, the Alameda County Early Childhood Policy Committee began back in 2000, approximately, and it began to focus on advocating for increasing funding for programs and services for young children and their families, and also increasing the awareness uh, around the importance of early uh, childhood. And at the time, the membership was um, included mostly health, mental health professionals, and learning and early learning providers. And as the county agencies begin to get more involved in family engagement um, and begin to partner more with strong family-run organizations, uh, they became more involved with the committee. And then the committee decided to move more toward a, a shared framework of more of a provider and family shared leadership framework. Um, and it wasn't really an easy transition. Uh, the group had to shift for more of an information exchange process uh, between providers, and it took more of a strategic focus in learning about the intricacy of systems um, and discussing, discussing more specific barriers and coming up with more concrete policy recommendations. So it became less focused on updates and information sharing um, among providers and more focused on learning and action. Um, and this shift also required a lot more time for planning and additional funding and a new shared uh, parent provider leadership structure. And through that transition, uh, it start, we had, you know, when it first started, the, the policy committee was, um, had a pretty large membership. And when this transition uh, started, we went down to maybe like, at sometimes it was only five to six people that were showing up for meetings. Um, but fortunately, after a few years of building our um, structure and uh, our membership, we have grown back to be about 25 to 30 folks at every meeting. But it was not an easy transition, just wanted to point that out. Um, and so the purpose of this policy committee, you can go to the next, oh, here we go. That's, sorry, still on purpose. Um, uh, the, the new kind of parent provider committee is to build consistent guidelines and principles and practice for parent-run and engagement organizations and to develop a shared understanding of our early childhood system of care, which is a pretty, can be pretty complicated, and so we're all learning together to understand the system. And we're also identifying leadership opportunities for parents to engage in decision making and to build parent leadership capacity within our institutions and systems. Um, and through this, we developed a very strong partnership with one of our local parent-run organizations called Parent uh, Voices Oakland. And it's a very small CBO. It started out with just, um, I believe, two staff people. And we started a contract with Parent Voices to help us uh, bring in the parent membership and the parent leaders to help us uh, develop the um, Alameda County Early Childhood Policy Committee. Next slide. So some of the lessons learned and strategies. Um, the first one is that we had to make sure that our meetings were much more accessible and relevant to the parents and providers that were attending. So when, as we were giving policy updates, we had to make sure these updates were provided with a lot of explanation, um, really light on the jargon and acronyms. Um, and it also requires really strong facilitation and good rapport with the regular attendees. So we can call out when you know acronyms are being used or when there's lots of jargon and make sure that everyone in the room is really understanding what's being presented. And we also uh, let's see, uh, spend a lot, a lot more time on in-depth learning. So this can mean that we spend at least two, min two meetings um, just learning about a particular aspect of the system and what might be working and what some of those barriers are. Um, we've talked about the early childhood mental health system, the early care and education system, and we focus on how these systems are funded and how folks are accessing these services and what might be some of the barriers. And we are really uh, conscious of making a balance with these presentations to make sure there's a lot of small group activities included in discussion, so it's not just people up there talking and um, relaying information, but there's a lot of time for discussion and, and planning. And also to plan these kinds of, you know, really um, uh, information-rich and engaging meetings, we have to have adequate time for planning. So this means that we have meetings before the big meetings to just talk about what kinds of activities and presentations um, 
will be presented, and also to make sure that our subcommittees are actually integrated into the larger uh, uh, policy committee. And this also requires funding and resources. So we have funding um, to support planning and the parent projects. So we have staff de dedicated to the planning, coordination, and facilitation. And we also have funding for a, one of our subcommittees, which is the Parent Forum. And this is an annual event, and it's planned and put on by the parents. So parents come together to discuss and develop policy recommendations around an issue that is important to them. So this year, as an example, uh, they, the, the topic was prioritizing equity. So it's supporting parents to support healthy children and stable communities. And as a result of this year's Parent Forum, a proposal was actually developed by the parents who participated to develop a child care voucher program for homeless families. And this proposal was then brought to the County Board of Supervisors to ask for funding. And we continue to use this proposal to advocate for funding throughout our, can or throughout our county for this critical need. There's also a very strong focus on capacity building in order to do this work. Um, which seems kind of obvious, but it's, it's definitely uh, takes more time than you might think, um, as some of the other uh, presenters mentioned earlier. So much, as I mentioned, much of this work is supported through a contract with Parent Voices, and they're a very small parent-run organization that didn't have a lot of experience initially with managing contracts and planning large events before starting uh, their work with the policy committee. And so this required a lot more time on the part of the systems leaders to help develop the scopes of work and the budgets and to ensure they understood that the, C that the CBO understood what was required for reporting. And then we also helped with some of the organizational development issues, strategic planning and staffing. Um, and more, most importantly was the capacity that the CBO helped with the systems. So parent voices and the parent membership at the committee has helped build the system's capacity for holding us accountable around our commitment to equity by calling out very explicitly when issues of race and power and, and privilege are at play in our meetings and through the services and programs we provide. And ultimately, this partnership better ensures that our services are more effective and more accessible and culturally responsible. Um, and this is really the heart of the work and what's most important about it. It also helps us develop concrete strategies for involving families in decision making. On to the next slide. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact that we've had. So these are the real concrete changes that we've had as a result of this work. So one thing that I mentioned before is that we have, because of these presentations and this forum to bring families and providers together, we're developing um, a place for, for learning to, for learning and information exchange to happen. Um, by having families involved in this, it increases the incentive and motivation to ensure that the, present, the pre presentation of information is more clear and focused, which actually ends up benefiting the entire cross-sector membership. So we're all learning together, um, and we're learning cross-sector about a, a pretty complicated system. And last, um, We've also been able to institute a parent-governed CalWORKs advisory committee within the Alameda County Social Services Agency as a result of this work. Um, as I mentioned before, our parent forum, uh, which is the parent-led event where parents come together and develop recommendations. Out of our per first parent forum, we developed something called the People's Task Force Project. And this was a parent-run project focused on getting consumer input to improve social services. Um, I could talk, I could do a whole presentation just on this particular project, but what I want to highlight today is that as a result of this work, which was really organizing families and, and getting their input, uh, this group was able to create this CalWORKs advisory committee, and CalWORKs is the uh, Welfare to Work program in California. And so now we have um, really an institutionalized parent voice and leadership committee within one of our largest county systems. So this is one of our most, uh, I think, biggest impacts of this work. And lastly, we have increased family and provider influence on county decision and policy making. So as a result of the committee meetings and the parent forum and the CalWORKs um, advisory committee, uh, we have pro provided places for families and providers to come together to develop policy priorities, proposals, and recommendations, which are now helping to shape county policy. And we're also working to help 
uh, develop better structures to incorporate family voice into our systems. Next slide. So lastly, I'm just going to uh, offer a little bit of advice of if you are interested in doing this kind of work um, in your organizations. First and foremost is to really find the right leaders um, and partners to help plan and facilitate this work. Um, it's critically important to have leaders who are comfortable with talking about race, class, um, and power. And providers, um, in particular, must also be willing to give up some of this power um, in shaping their own agenda or give up their, you know, with their kind of being more flexible with their agenda and be very open to hearing honest feedback um, about their services and policies. And they must also be reflective of their own personal privilege and power when partnering with families. Uh, this is probably the most important and um, critical point I want to make because this pretty much comes up all the time um, in our planning meetings, at the wider community meetings, and you just have to always be conscious of this in order for the work to be authentic, meaningful, and to have a real impact. And it's also important to include parents from the very beginning. So as opposed to just setting up an advisory committee and inviting parents to attend, it's, you really want to help have families there helping to shape the project from the beginning uh, to make sure that, you know, to have them input into what the committee should be focused on, what the structure might look like, what the goals should be, and then having the parents really help invite the right people to the committee and to make sure that it's accessible um, and relevant to the families uh, that are participating. And lastly, um, as I mentioned before, we have funding for this particular project, um, staff time and funding. So you definitely need to resource it. Um, there, we have a contract with Parent Voices, and our contract is approximately $35,000. Um, and this helps with that planning effort around planning the policy committee and also funds that parent forum event and planning committee. And then there's also funding through the Alameda County Social Services Agency to staff the CalWORKs Advisory Committee. And this funding helps support a coordinator for that work, as well as stipends to compensate parents for their time and expertise. So in order, yeah, in order for this to really be um, impactful and not just, you know, signing off that you have parent involvement, you need to resource it. It needs to be very intentional. Uh, and um, we hope that learning from these different efforts will then you know, increase more resources for this uh, effort across all the systems within our county. So thank you, and I'll uh, turn it back over to Malia. Thank you so much, um, Lisa. That was, you really raised some amazingly important points. And now we have, um, not quite 10 minutes, but some time to get some questions. And I wanted to start with a question we received earlier. Uh, meanwhile, if you have other questions, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, and any questions we don't answer, we will um, compile in an email and send it out to our participant group. So one uh, question that we got um, was specific to how can we meaningfully, well, let's see, uh, how can we meaningfully in, uh, get feedback and input from parents, and how do you reach parents who are not already involved? And I wanted to direct that question to the Palm Beach County team, Lanita and Marsha. Thank you, Malia. This is Lanita. What we've learned from our Bridges Clay Space Initiative um, is the importance of finding out who the neighborhood considers to be the active, outspoken parent. Um, sometimes we come into communities and, you know, uh, as providers, we think it's one person, but it's actually the neighborhood, the families have a, a different view on it. So we, identify, we help them or allow them to, to tell us, you know, who should we be contacting first. And then in many of these disenfranchised communities, we found that word of mouth is critical. So, you know, we get some of these parents involved, we engage them in meaningful conversation. We ask for permission to engage with them in this body of work. And then when we structure some of our um, cafes and town hall meetings, you know, we try to make sure that it's convenient for our families. So many times that means in the evening. And we have to provide meals because we want to break down any barriers 
for families to attend. It might also mean that we offer some incentives or that we offer child care, free child care for families. In, in some instances, it may even mean providing transportation so families can get there. Uh, but that, I think, has been very successful for our initiative. And then what we've also found is that we encourage each parent, you know, to reach a parent. And when they bring new parents to some of our programs to take advantage of the services, you know, there's also um, incentives there. So for many of our families, we recognize that they don't have uh, the financial means, but we know that their time is very valuable. So, you know, we really encourage them. We thank them for their participation. We show them that we value that participation. And generally, they continue to come out and continue to bring new members. The only other thing that Thank I would you, add um, to what Lanita said is to not be afraid to go into whatever naturally occurring spaces families are, um, already are. We've also uh, spent a significant amount of time training other trusted community members with the message. So you as the provider and the system does not always have to be the one that's sharing the good news or whatever information. We have that shared in families' natural ways of speaking and communicating in their own vernacular and in their own um, community norms. And the only other piece that I would say is that especially for those who are very hard to engage, you need to, we need to make sure that we have a specific role and function for families to play when we invite them to some of these settings and tables. Oftentimes we're just like, oh, let's get, gather parents together, but we, we're not clear as to what specific expectation or role we want them to play, and so we find that they don't remain consistent in their participation and in their actions. So we need to be really clear about the roles. Thank you so much. I want to make sure we get to um, one or two more questions. We, of course, don't have enough time, but we, um, we did get a question for Lisa. Um, can you clarify how the Alameda County Early Childhood Policy Committee became parent-led? What, why did the leaders, original leaders of this group, decide they wanted parents to be the drivers of the work? That's a very good question. Uh, so I wasn't involved at the very beginning of when this started, but um, my understanding is that what happened was there was a, a very strong parent leader that was attending the, the meetings um, who was involved in the, uh, who was a member of the Child Care Planning Council. and. Uh, Clarissa, who wasn't able to be on the call today, was his parent leader, and she's actually the co-facilitator of the meeting now um, with myself. Uh, she is, a, is the executive director of Parent Voices Oakland, and so she was really encouraging the committee to be more parent-focused, and meanwhile, and more parent-led, and meanwhile, there, the systems were also, uh, for example, behavioral health care the behavioral health care system was involved in a, pub, uh, in a federal grant called Early Connections that had a very strong um, parent voice uh, um, movement going on in that uh, system. And so I think the combination of those two things happening and the timing led to there being a stronger emphasis on bringing families into that committee. And I think the goal of that was to have families there sitting at the table helping us develop these policies. So don't just make the policy without the people there you know, it's a, no policy about the people without the people there was really, I think, the, the impetus for making this happen. Um, it did, like I mentioned, take a long time uh, to really get the committee, I think, functioning together and have our goals pretty clear to the membership. Um, but I think that was really the goal, was to have families there learning about these systems and to really help influence the policy. And then to also get better uh, systems in place within county um, structures for parent, for authentic parent leadership and decision making, which we're still working on. That's going to be, I think, an ongoing progress process. So we're, uh, this is Malia again. Um, to close out, I want to just say that um, we are going to take time to sift through the questions that you submitted and come up with um, a document that we can share. But I especially want to encourage you to respond to the survey that's going to pop up after we uh, close this out. And that will help you um, drive what's going to happen next. Um, we really want to hear from you um, about next steps for this project. People asked about evaluation tools. People asked about print materials. 
these are all things that we want to hear from you what's going to be most um, important. As we close out, I want to thank you, our almost 374 participants, I counted at the very high point, um, who listened today and participated. I want to thank CSSP and our EC-Link uh, community for their support all along. Um, of course, First 5 for its leadership, and especially to the 20 families who shared their experiences in focus groups and to the focus group hosts who are listed on this last slide. Um, so I just want to say we're so honored to have you be a part of this work, and we hope to continue this conversation in many other ways. Thank you for participating. Please complete the survey, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.